that point when your kids don't want to talk to you. When they're little, they want to tell you everything. And then they get big and it feels like there's a big gap. And it happens in Western families too. And so the best I can do for my kids is to make sure they have other adults they do talk to. I think also um, different generations. My dad, he's not good at sharing his emotions. He's just looks good on the outside, but I know inside there are times when he probably it would be healthy for him to talk to someone. So it might be hard work, but as adults, we need to model for our kids also, sharing that we need help, or that we're having a bad day, or that we feel stressed and we're trying to figure it out, so that they can understand it's very normal and human to have emotions and to talk about them. And it will be hard work. But I think um, if they see you trying to be vulnerable, maybe they will also choose to be vulnerable. When you read the story of David in scripture, you see David rising up to be a mighty leader, but David also makes mistakes. And when you read the Psalms, you see how much David struggled and he was very, very vulnerable and very human and it's very normal um, and healthy to talk about those things. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I I 
So here's the question. Um, we as parents, uh, most of us mm -hmm. in our culture, in our community, most of our parents, they are already struggling with positive stress and then positive stress. Uh, we are unable to um, sort them out. With them. We are unable to work them with our children. Mm -hmm. So they reach to a uh, toxic stress. So we clearly see that they are stressed. They have already have depression. They have they already struggle with mental health, right? Mm -hmm. And then if we offer our children counseling, and maybe perhaps we go to a counselor, they they would refuse it. But how do we work with that mm -hmm. when they are refusing help? And then how can we walk around that? Mm -hmm. That's so hard. No. Um, I think sometimes your children don't want to hear it from you. <laughs> if, if my son were struggling and I was pretty sure it was depression or anxiety, I would tell them, first step, we need to go see the doctor. Okay. Because it actually is a medical condition in our bodies, and sometimes our bodies don't give us the right hormones or chemicals, and our brain can't function properly. Um, and sometimes I think students listen better to the doctor than they will to their parents. So that if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, here's what we will try, maybe they will listen better to that. And sometimes a student actually needs to go to the doctor by themselves or to go with another adult friend and not with their mom or dad so that they feel um, like they get to be a bit responsible for their own health. I think also last night we did a session with the young people and we talked a little bit about mental health and stress but maybe another session like that where they can go and there can be more specific in invitations given to them. He if you want to manage your mental health, here are the things you need to do. That maybe that also helps them not just say, oh, my dad thinks he knows, but now someone else knows too, right? That they'll, they'll hear it better from someone else. Uh, is that you can find it so Mm -hmm. Okay, because we're talking about mental health, I think we'll move into the next part of the presentation and then we'll have more questions. Okay. All right. A number of years ago, my husband and I went camping on the Sunshine Coast and it was before we had kids and life was wonderful. We had so much free time and we took some kayaks with us to go kayaking. Uh, 
And in the left, you can see how smooth the water is. And we set out first thing in the morning, and the paddling was so nice and so easy. It was so smooth. And on the way back in the afternoon, the water started to get choppy and the waves got big and I was very worried that our boat was going to flip and I didn't know what we were going to do. <laughs> and we made it back safely, uh, but it was a lot of work and we were very exhausted at the end. I don't know, oh, it's a little bit blurry. In the middle it says, we are not all in the same boat. So during the pandemic, this meme often would go around saying we're, we're um, all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And when I think about where we are kayaking in the big waves, if we had been in a bigger boat with a motor, it would have been just fine. But when we were in a small boat and paddling ourselves, it was overwhelming. Mm. And it turns out that in life, we all have a certain amount of elastic, a certain amount of stretch that we have to manage what's coming at us. And the way we manage life has to do with our mental health. Uh, it's like elastic, how much stretch we have to manage, what's going on in our lives. I think for a long time when we thought about mental health, we thought about it as mental illness, that we would only hear about it when someone wasn't doing well. Someone wasn't? Wasn't, was not doing well, yeah. Mm. And our mental health, uh, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's poor. So good mental health is when we are thinking or acting or feeling in ways that allow you to approach life and its challenges with strength and hope. Uh, when we have poor mental health, it means that for a space of time, it's hard to meet the demands of everyday life with clear thinking or positive think feelings. Sorry, the positive part's cut off. Um, and when you think about our, your mental health, it's true. There are some days you feel full of energy and ready to face the day, and other days that are harder. Mm. 
这个网站跟这个他在网络这一面去过，网络站你就比较明显多。嗯。Um, sometimes the language that's used to describe mental health is about languishing and flourishing. Languish, Languish yeah. Uh, I'll describe them a little bit. So um, flourishing is like a plant that is growing really well. Um, languishing is like a plant that isn't getting what it needs and it's falling over. Uh, so, ที่หน้าอโคลีเอ่อเป็นแบบอกว่าจะอปาร์ตเดย์ตัวเป็นอปาร์อาจารย์เดย์อาวุธเทคโนโลยีจุนเอ่อที่หน้าอปาร์ต
Uh, someone who's struggling with depression will find it hard to work toward the future. So hard to do their schoolwork, hard to engage in things because they don't have any hope that they will ever be able to do that. Depression, I mean, to say that is what to and um, it, they can actually feel quite desperate in that. Um, and uh, those who are depressed, um, those who are anxious, when they're doing their schoolwork, Maybe they're doing it and doing it again and doing it again because they really want to make sure they get it right and they're not quite sure if they can, so they will get, they will try extra hard. Um, a student who's depressed might not actually want to do their homework at all or want to do anything because they see no purpose in it. It feels hopeless. And both anxiety and depression, um, there can be a minor form. So we can have situational anxiety. If a mouse ran through the room right now, my heart rate would accelerate, I would probably jump on a chair and I would scream, right? I would be anxious. And short-term anxiety is normal. It's understandable. It happens for all of us. You go to a new place. You have to speak with a translator, right? You can feel anxious. <laughs> Depression can also be situational. There can be times where we just feel a heaviness or a sadness, maybe about the state of the world or about how life hasn't turned out like you hoped it would. Um, and it's okay to feel like that sometimes, but when it's all the time, it's too much. Mm. And so you want to know what do you watch out for? When do you know if it's just a little bit of anxiety and depression and that's okay? Or when do we need to be worried? So if your student is having trouble managing everyday tasks, missing lots of school, complaining they feel sick, then we need to pay attention. If they have growing negative or anxious feelings that don't get any difference, even if they're in a different environment, then we need to be worried. Mm. If um, their difficulty in coping isn't just with schoolwork, but spreads to not wanting to see their friends, not wanting to come to church, not wanting to go to new places, if it shows up in different parts of their life, then we need to be worried. So, uh, uh, 
呃，这跟他们比较像，发生了比较其他的多少个错误，比较多的个等等等等。我们的，咱们这个民族啊，我回公司不错，点个错误的，俺是俺是看这个，看这个个嘞，批判的个嘞嘛，批判，我给看这个个嘞，确实有点难搞，就是难弄。And so when we are concerned at that level, at that point, we need to, number one, take them to a medical doctor for an assessment. Sometimes with depression or anxiety, it can take a while for the medication to start to make a difference. Um, and the doctor will then give you a treatment plan. So they might encourage you to go to a mental health clinic, to see a counselor, or to go to a group support where you get to interact with other people that are struggling. <coughs> and uh, I think there comes a point as a parent when you insist that your child goes to the doctor. Um, because with their mental health, we want to make sure that they're well cared for. I think sometimes as uh, followers of Jesus, we can wonder if mental health, uh, is it a spiritual attack? Uh, but I think um, there's this bit where I think so there, there can be a spiritual aspect to it but our bodies are made up of like a physical self and then our brain or mental self and our spiritual self and sometimes those things overlap and sometimes caring for one part is separate for caring from the other parts <laughs> Uh, I think that as a parent, it can be scary for your children to be dealing with something that you don't fully understand and overwhelming. Uh, I was I shared with Bowie some um, resources off of our website from Life Teams, and then a couple of other organizations that have really good resources for caring for mental health, um, and to make sure that he's got the links for those. So if you are looking for help, there's a group of youth clinics that have been created in the Greater Vancouver area called Foundry. Uh, and the Foundry Clinic, um, they are walking clinics for mental health. There's uh, North Vancouver, Vancouver, I think New West, Surrey, Langley. There's a whole bunch of yeah, walk-in mental health. And they will see them and get them some uh, someone to speak to that day. Okay. They have available doctors. Yeah, available doctors and counselors right away, yeah. And really good resources. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
When we don't care for our mental health, it can get worse. Mm-hmm. Um, I think sometimes also as parents, we can feel really guilty uh, when our child is struggling. In uh, the book of John, in uh, chapter 9, Jesus heals a man who is born of blindness, born with blindness. And the Pharisees, they say to Jesus, who is sinful? Is the man sinful or is parents sinful? What sin created this problem? And Jesus said, neither this man or his parents have sinned. This man was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. In Lamentations, we see Jeremiah the prophet struggling with his mental help. Mental health. And God reminds him that he will bring him hope. But to deal with our mental health with only spiritual resources might not be enough. When my youngest son was four years old, he broke his femur, his bone, right above his knee. My son. Yeah. And of course, I believe that God can heal. So I guess we could have just prayed for him in the park to see that God would heal his leg. But we realized God has given us good doctors, and so we took him to the hospital. Mm. And he had a cast that went from his hip to his ankle. And we were worried, actually, when his cast came off, that maybe it would impact his walking for the rest of his life. And we did pray for God to heal him. Uh, And I think that God did, by giving us the right doctor at the right time to do the right medical procedures, right? That he's, you can't tell now at all. Um, I think as parents we can feel guilty when our children struggle. Like maybe we didn't do the right thing, or if we'd been a better parent, it wouldn't be like this. But I think that might actually be an attack from the devil. Because God knows your children and loves them and he's going to take care of them. Right? And he's, he's given us good doctors to care for them too. I have a few more things for you to think about uh, how we care for our youth and their mental health. How can we? Care for our youth with their mental health. Mm. 
The first thing is we need to remember our feelings are not the same as what is actually happening. Our feelings aren't always true. When you go on a roller coaster, you feel frightened, but it's not the same as a bear showing up that you maybe need to run away from or fight. We need to show empathy to young people. So we need to actually step into their shoes and think about what it feels like to feel like they feel. <laughs> Mm. We need to ask them what they need. Sometimes you actually know what you need, and if someone asked you, you could tell them. Sometimes what they need is just for you to sit with them, not to say anything. Remember um, when kids are really little and they're sleepy and they just want to crawl on your lap and snuggle with you? And our teens are too big to sit on our laps now. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But maybe instead you bring them their, their favorite iced coffee or their favorite bubble tea and you just sit together. Mm. Mm. Or you take them for ice cream. Or ice cream, but I think sometimes just coming alongside so they know they're not alone is really important. Um, for some of you, Maybe you've struggled a little bit with your mental health, but you've never talked to your kids about it, that there was a dark time for you or a time that felt hopeless uh, or a time where you felt overwhelmed. And maybe you sharing a little bit of that with them will bring them some encouragement that they're not the only person that's ever felt this way. <laughs> Um, we also need to bring them encouragement to let them know that this is likely a season of time and it will pass. Mm. Just like winter in Vancouver when it rains every day and then one day the sunshine comes. <laughs> Finally, we need to include them 
as we try and figure out what they need from us. We can't tell them what will make them better. We need to ask them and work together to make a plan. Uh, I think they, a young person feeling empowered, like they have power in the decisions they make, actually encourages them. Mm. All right, do you have any more questions? similar in the way they behave. <laughs> yeah. When you're little and you don't know how to express yourself, you lay on the floor and you kick and scream. <laughs> And I think teenagers are the same. They don't have words. Yeah. I think in that situation, I would give them a choice to say, would you like to talk to the doctor or would you like to talk to your youth leader? Give them a choice of who to talk to. But maybe to let, to let them know, I'm concerned, you don't seem okay. So who would you like to choose to talk to? Yeah. Um, and then I would just keep paying attention to how they're doing. So then, and for your part, they get that and if, if there was a way that I could try to uh, reduce extra pressure I was putting on them, I would think about, is there any way I can make life a little easier for them right now? I don't know if I can think of anything else right now.
I think it starts here when we think about the fact that we all have mental health just like we all have physical health and um, if someone gets a cold we don't speak poorly of them and if someone is depressed we know that they're now vulnerable and they're in need of help yeah Okay, yeah, I have my uh, uh, Christian. So, the community I told me, he didn't take a lot of data, he talked about my depression. He got a lot of data, he didn't take a lot of data. He was in the community, he didn't take a lot of data, he was in the community, 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 he was in the community. เอ่อเอ่อเรื่องเสียงมันมีเจนิตุจูแต่ที่เอ่อเรื่องมีดูมีเหตุปุ่มตั้งสามันดับตั้งแต่เอ่อเรื่องทุกคนทุกคนทุ
I think uh, young women also open up better to an, uh, a woman, and young men will open up better to a man. Uh, you're doing a wonderful job of investing in your youth leaders by having a weekend like this where there's training for them and I'd encourage you please to keep training your Sunday school teachers and your youth leaders because they will have a huge impact on your children and youth. To reach to unreachable people. Mm -hmm. That's 
we know that. We try to reach people, unreachable people, trying to spread the gospel, but we are missing that point. We are not able to reach our own children. We are unable to meet them because the way they view themselves, the way we view them as they are sinner, you mm. know. So they don't want to come to church, they don't want to get involved, mm -hmm. right? So when that happens within our own community, within our own church, we are losing our children. How do you handle mm. that situation? It's you got the end of the How? It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, I think I would try to consider what's the ultimate goal that you have for your children. So maybe that's the first thing. Okay. Uh, what's the goal you want for your children? When, when they're adults, what do you hope for them? And then maybe work backwards to figure out what you ask from them today to get them to end up that way at the end. Fashion is complicated. <laughs> the what, what young girls wear these days are just ugly. <laughs> Right? It's, and so, um, uh, I, well, some things are the same as what I wear, but some things, right? I would think, I remember talking with a student about how she wants the world, what she wants the world to know about her from the way she dresses. That that's a question I would ask. And if the things you value are respect for all people, respect for older people, respect for their friends, respect for their friends' parents, then you inst work with them to say respect is a value do you value respect how will you show that in your life um, I think too, I would talk to them, have a conversation about if their faith or learning about faith is important to them and figure out if that would be in this place or if you could trust another church to care for them and their spiritual needs. I know some families and they go to church together on Sunday morning, but their children go to youth group at a different church. Because they want their children to grow in their faith and they don't want to fight with them about how they grow, they just want them to grow. Yeah. I think if you have a picture of how you hope they turn out as adults and you work backwards, maybe the things you worry about today are different. Mm -hmm. 
When I was 20 something, 20, I had blue streaks in my hair and I had an earring in my eyebrow and I think my mom was very worried about how I was going to turn out. <laughs> And even now, I think maybe she wishes I'd wear lipstick or dresses more often, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I think she's content with the character that I have developed and my excitement for God. Uh, because fashions come and go, right? Um, but the character in your heart, that's who you are. And you want to worry about who they are being more than maybe some of the things they are doing. Yeah. Mm. But that's hard. <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy task. And especially to oh, to let go, to open your hand and release a bit of that is hard. Instead of helping them, we are the cause that make them 
future war because we don't know how to deal with that. I think some of it is just tricking your brain into seeing mental health as health. So it's like imagining if someone, in the Bible it talks about people who are poor in spirit. I think that's mental health. And so it's like imagining that that person has like an emotional flu and just choosing to treat them with that same care and attention. Um, you might think about there's a mental health first aid course that you can take um, which I've taken um, but you might think about getting some people in your church trained in mental health first aid and maybe they could run a support group for people who are struggling with their mental health so they know that they could come to that space and people would know how to hold them tenderly right that you might need to train and equip some people to be the ones who would step forward to care for that group more specifically which I think would offer some people would feel more knowledgeable and more in control of the understanding and for the young people they would also feel some people were more equipped and better able to help and maybe to remember um, we don't we don't harm anyone by asking about their mental health that it actually shows good care to say you seem down are you okay right or is there a way I could care for you or you seem you seem depressed <laughs> can I can I help you it's okay to ask
So this is more the, um, so when we clearly see someone struggling with their mental health mm -hmm. and that they have seen they have hospital lines that doctor says mm -hmm. and then they release them, still they are struggling mm -hmm. and we see that they are danger to themselves. Mm -hmm. But the doctor has discharged them. How can we help? Mm -hmm. Is there any way that we could um, help that person? Mm -hmm. um, if someone is a danger to themselves, but the doctor right then doesn't think they need to be in the hospital, there are two very important questions to ask. The first question is, do you have a plan to harm yourself? So that's the first question, if you want to tell them. Yes, you should ask the person, do you have a plan to harm yourself? And the second question is, do you have an intention to harm yourself? So, do you, are you intending to do something to harm yourself? And you can ask them both those questions on a scale of 1 to 10. So if 10 is definitely and 1 is not at all, do you have an a plan to harm yourself? Maybe it's a 2 out of 10, so not really a plan. Do you have an intention to harm yourself? It's an 8 out of 10. Then you need to call for help. Call nine one one. Oh well, if if the student or the person will go with you, go back to the hospital. And if they won't go, call 911. Yeah. Even if it makes them angry. <laughs> because they are so valuable to us. Yeah. Sometimes the hospital is really busy or really full and they do their best, but they don't see everything. So sometimes we have to go back again and again. Yeah, so earlier uh, you talked quite a bit about you know, toxic uh, stress. So my question is how do we how do we help the person to do a lot to the point where they are now emotionally numb? They don't feel anything at all. They're often perceived as emotionalist, others describe as symptom like Probably it would be good for them to see a counselor, right? That they're so detached from their feelings. But I think sometimes helping those people get in touch with their five emotions can help. So if they can notice a little bit of beauty in nature, right? To notice a beautiful flower, to smell the scent of something delicious, maybe it's chocolate, right? But to get them with their emotions, that can actually help them. It's called grounding. It, kind of reminds you to be connected to your five senses, to be fully the way God made you to be. But it would be tiny step by tiny step, right? That they've felt so much that they can't feel anymore. So you would want to help them slowly reconnect with their emotions and their senses and their feelings. But they probably need to see a counselor.
How do you do that to activate the you know, their five senses? The, it, well, I think it could be to sit outside with them under a cedar tree. You can smell the cedar tree and ask them, can you smell that? Or um, bring them a flower, a, a rose that smells beautiful, right? And ask them to smell it. You could pull your shoe off, get them to smell that. But <laughs> that you would just want to remind them, even sometimes people's fingers, to feel something really smooth or something really rough, that will help them notice that there's, to, to remind them of more to life than just the numbness that they're feeling. Does that make sense? God has given us so much, right? And um, I think what we know about mental health today is more than we knew even five years ago. So it's a, it's a big journey of learning, but God is equipping his people to figure out how to care well for the body of Christ. And uh, I'll be praying for you. Um, I am so touched at how much you love your young people and how much you want to connect with them and uh, that you want them to know the fullness of God's love. And so I'll be praying for you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh,